Hello, this is Elliot Zareski Williams, CTO and co-founder of Neuralist. And today we'll be talking about evolutionary degenerative medicine with applications to COVID-19. Table of contents. So this presentation is really going to be broken down into three parts. Uh, we have generative modeling background, and then part two is going to be neuroevolution, which really is a class of algorithms that's going to help us improve our generative models. And then part three is sort of going to be how we tie it all together, uh, and then how it can be applied to uh, medicine today, and specifically COVID-19. Part one, generative modeling background. There are two popular deep learning approaches to generative modeling today, uh, in specifically computer vision. They are variational autoencoders and then generative adversarial networks or GANs. These two have many variants. Um, there's even a hybrid model called the VAE GAN, which maximizes the strengths of both models while sort of addressing some of their weaknesses. So the reason why these are so popular is because we've sort of just failed to get results uh, using the classic approaches like of Gaussian mixture models. Uh, trick bolson machines, uh, etc. So pretty much traditional statistics and early machine learning approaches just sort of failed to produce the results that the VAEs and GANs produce today. So this is, these are why these are the most popular deep learning frameworks uh, for generative modeling today. Let's sort of just get into them one at a time. So we'll first talk about variational autoencoders and what the heck are they? So the variational autoencoders really are, uh, they consist of two networks, an encoder network and a decoder network. And I'm sort of just going to walk through exactly how they uh, how they work. So the first thing that happens is the encoder network learns to take in the original data and learns a compressed representation of that data. And then the next thing that happens is the compressed representation is then used to create a distribution. And you can think of the distribution as living in some high dimensional space. It's all very abstract. That is uh, essentially what's going on in this, the second part. The third part is then a decoder then samples from this distribution and it learns to generate data that's similar to the original data. Let's look, let's look at a picture, right? Because the picture picture is worth a thousand words. So let's say we feed an image of a cat, right? Or let's say a couple cats. So the encoder learns to compress this cat and let's say a few number, into a few number of pixels. And then you use that to create a mean vector and a standard deviation vector. And this is this comes from all the cats that are fed into it. And then once you take these two vectors, you then create a distribution, a normal distribution specifically, and then you sample from that distribution. And then that sample is then fed into the decoder network, and then something that looks like the cats is generated. So that's really how it works. You take, you, you learn a distribution here in the middle, and then you sample from it, and then you create something that looks similar to the original data. So what is this data set here? So this data set here is the, the Celeb A data set. And what's going on here is that the, uh, this essentially is a data set of, of celebrity faces. And what's happening is that the VAE is uh, trained on these celebrity faces and it learns to generate realistic looking celebrity faces. So none of the faces you see in this image are actually real. They're simply just some data that's been generated from the VAE after it was trained um, on the on the data set. So let's now move to generative adversarial networks. So just like the VAEs, these have two networks and they're going to be the discriminator and then a generator network. And the goal of the GAN is that you want the generator to learn to create realistic looking fake data samples out of noise while the discriminator learns to tell the real data from the fake data that came out of the generator. So you can take the random noise and you feed it through the generator. You can think of it as like a magical box, right? The, the magical box eats the noise and outputs something that looks like the original data. So if we're training on handwritten digits, like on this example, the generator is going to learn to output something that looks like a handwritten digit. And the discriminator is going to be like, okay, is that real or is that, or is that fake? Or, you know, so and that's the goal of the GAN training, really. Now let's look at the GAN faces of Celeb A. So you see here, there are some qualitative differences between this one and the VAE generated Celeb A faces. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a huge body of computer vision research that sort of talks about the similarities and differences between what you get out of both kinds of models. Uh, we're not going to get into it too much because that's kind of, you know, very specific to computer vision. But anyway, this is kind of just a little bit of a sample of that. But now we're going to turn our attention to something that looks a little bit cooler than this. If you want to play a little game, feel free to pause the video for, you know, one or two seconds uh, to see which one you think is real or fake. Uh, and so I'll, I'll pause for a second. Okay, so now that we've hopefully played this little game, which one of these are real, which one of these are fake? Turns out that actually these are both fake. So the one on the left, uh, looks. if you look at the bottom of this guy's chin, uh, it looks like he has, you know, something that's maybe not a realistic looking skin there. But the guy on the right, I think, looks pretty realistic. None of these are real. These images came from the output of something called a style GAN, and that is you can you can find uh, this um, at, the, at this website called thispersonisnotexist.com, and you can just Google it, and every time you refresh the page, a new fake image uh, pops up, and this literally just comes from noise. You take some random noise and it learns to create this, and so that's pretty cool. But why do we care about this per se, right? So 
how does this apply to medicine? So GANs can do a lot more than just do fake images. It's just, that's just simply what they're popularized for. So if you can, you can do 1D convolution, uh, which is in contrast to the images, which are 2D convolution, and that, that can learn to reconstruct signals. Um, and or you know try to generate new signals and 3d convolution is, is really appropriate for volumetric data and video so let's say you have a, a 3d x-ray or just 3d anything that you want to study so a 3d convolution essentially is a, very appropriate for that if you wanted to let's say have a video and you wanted to stack individual frames that is a perfect use case for 3d convolution let's look at exactly how that would work so we can take a noise vector z and you put it, put it through the generator, and then once it's trained, you're gonna learn to actually output something that looks like a 3D object, like a chair here. So literally, you can take the noise and then output a 3D object. That's essentially the goal of a GAN in, if you were doing it on 3D. And some of you may already be thinking, okay, I think I know where he's going with this. And you're right, because you could use this to generate protein structures that you could study for, you know, for learning anything you want to about proteins, really. And then one more thing, in case people are confused about this term voxel, uh, voxel is just, uh, is just short for volumetric pixel. So it's just like kind of like a 3D pixel. So if anyone's confused about that, that's what it means. So now moving on. This will be a quick little rundown of VEs and GANs. Uh, it's not too important that we know everything that's on this, but really the, the they learn to optimize a distribution such that the data is sampled from. Whereas GANs focus more on generating the data itself. There's less information about the distribution, but they get better results, quote unquote. Um, and then VEs do the opposite. Um, and then typically speaking, what happens is that GANs are very unstable to train and they're very sensitive to hyperparameters. So GANs have a lot of problems. They certainly can produce quote unquote better results and most people would agree that the images look pretty realistic when you use GANs versus VAEs, but they have problems. And one of them is gonna be mode collapse. Let's, let's look Let's look at mode collapse. The top images, you'll see that if you look at um, some of the images in the middle, say if you look at the upper left, the sixes over here look very, very similar. And if you look at some of the other ones, there are a couple A's that look almost identical. Like if you look at the uh, the third image at the top, uh, second from the right, uh, a lot of the A's look very similar. So that's an example of what's called partial mode collapse. And this is where the GAN learns to generate a very small variety of samples, and this is not desirable. And this can be taken to the extreme case, which is what's called total mode collapse, which you see at the bottom. So total mode collapse is when the generator learns to generate just one, or almost just one, quote unquote, almost, uh, type of data. So it, it, when everything looks the same, that's an example of mode collapse, and you do not want this during training. And this happens often enough, and it's it's annoying and very undesirable. VEs and uh, GANs have the strengths and weaknesses, uh, but it's easier to address GAN weaknesses. Uh, and one way to do this is through feature analysis, and there are lots of other techniques that exist. But we're not going to get into them in too much detail because that's uh, that's, that's uh, very technical and little not um, not as important for, for this talk. But just to be aware that it's easier to address, in my opinion, weaknesses of GANs than is for VAEs. How do we improve GAN training exactly? So really after six years of research, uh, GAN training is still, uh, it's jury still out how to make them perfect or even just decent. We don't have a, we, we don't have a strong theoretical framework for how they work. Uh, so we have pieces of the puzzle and certainly we developed uh, rules of thumb which are grounded in actual solid research, but nothing's comprehensive. So really it boils down to engineering, you know, try this, try that approach. So when we actually optimize these GANs, what the heck are we actually doing? What do I actually mean when I say that? So when you train deep learning models, uh, GANs in particular, there are parameters which are learned during training. And these parameters are uh, tweaked by gradient descent such that they learn to optimize uh, some function, and that's the loss function. So what the, param the hy hyperparameters refer to quantities that are not changed during training. For example, the number of layers in your network is fixed throughout the entire training process. That's an example of a hyperparameter. And GANs take a long time to train, right? And getting poor quality results you do not, you do not want at all. And hyperparameter optimization is a difficult task to do for GANs. So that's where neuroevolution comes in. So neuroevolution is really the application of genetic algorithms to train GANs, or really any deep learning model for that matter, where you essentially can automate the search for good GAN models. It's really like, you can think of it as like AI building AI. A question you might be asking yourself is why would we actually want to spend all that time, for those of you who know about genetic algorithms, know that they take a long time, a long time to actually you know, run, why would we actually want to do this? And I'll touch more about this in, in, in part two. Let's talk about the resurgence of these algorithms. So these actually were first formulated in 1960, uh, but they became more popular in the 1990s. So some people argue that this uh, lack of success came from computational power. And now that we have more computational power, they're witnessing some other resurgence. Um, like I said, they have some limitations, but they, and they are very computationally expensive, but they've been, used, they've been successfully used in many cases. Now let's sort of talk about how they're getting applied to GAN. When you optimize in GANs, these are certainly six criteria you want to consider. So the optimizer for the generator versus the optimizer for the discriminator. 
So these don't even have to be the same. A lot of times people use the same optimizer and the same learning rate, etc., for both networks. This is not strictly needed. Sometimes it might be better to use a different optimizer uh, for one network versus the other. And also types of layers. What kind of layers are you having in your networks? The number of layers you want to put in there, the epics, how long you want to train it for, and the batch size, which is how many data samples you put in at a time, and then data pre-processing steps. A lot of times people neglect how important data pre-processing is. They focus too much on the model and then are stuck when the model does not perform well. Having a good data pre-processing can actually make all the difference. And three quantities that are particularly interesting are the input image size, the GAN, the noise shape, and the noise distribution. These all are important. Let's kind of talk about how these work, right? So those of you who don't know how these work. So genetic algorithms are where you take a bunch of candidate solutions, and these are called chromosomes or species. And the idea is you evolve them over time to produce more fit solutions. And you really evolve them until some kind of stopping criteria is reached, uh, you know, some predefined fitness threshold, um, or, you know, you complete a fixed number of generations. That's really what, what that's how you evolve them for. That's how, how long you evolve them for. So with each generation, you, you score each individual. And this is uh, quantified by a fitness function. And the idea is that you take the most fit individuals and somehow carry uh, what the aspects that make them fit to the next generation. And unsurprisingly, there are many ways you can set this up. So unlike gradient descent, which really is a calculus based approach, um, you, you, you're really utilizing information uh, that you gain from going across the law surface. Genetic algorithms are meta heuristic. And what that means is they really just sort of do, they, they, they have a hypothesis that, okay, these models are more fit, we're gonna keep them and we're gonna get better over time. That claim is not really challenged, it's sort of, you, you assume it to be true. It's more axiomatic, um, that's really what a meta heuristic really is. But but it, it, it works it works you know fairly well most of the time. Now. Like I said, they're more popular. They're they're a little bit more popular in previous decades, um, but now there's a little bit more of a resurgence, making them a little bit more popular today. What we did at Neuralist is we're actually currently running an experiment where we are going to neural evolve a bunch of GANs for familiar data sets, uh, MNIST and CIFAR. And the idea is that these are going to be building blocks to uh, something a little bit more useful, interesting. But let's sort of talk about how we set up this experiment. So our solutions, our chromosomes. Uh, are going to be the GAN architectures, the different kinds of models, the choice of optimizers, and the noise distribution. And then uh, also we're going to evolve what's called an elitist selection approach. So typically when you pick the most of the individuals, there are a couple ways you, you can do that. So, and rather, when you initialize the next generation, how you take the information from the previous generation is called selection. So the, a common way to do this is a crossover mutation. And that's really where you uh, take the most of the individuals, you consider them parents, and then you uh, you take uh, you kind of cross over the aspects you believe to make them fit, and then they go into the next generation. And the elitist one, you skip that step altogether. You simply just say, okay, the models which end up being the most fit, we're going to keep. And then the next generation sort of going to always have at least the as good as the previous generation um, of, of models. That's the idea behind elitist selection. And the reason why this was chosen over the crossover mutation approach is that the crossover mutation has, has no guarantee of doing well over time and it takes a lot of time to actually train so in the interest of saving you know compute time at least selection makes sense and in, another thing we want to consider is we want our fitness function to prefer smaller models because certainly if you could do well with smaller models that's certainly preferable to doing well with a larger model all things else being equal and then of course we want to have low loss because low loss means that the generator is generating great results and the discriminator is actually good at telling fake from real so that's what that's what we want so in this experiment we specifically set up 10 chromosomes this would be 10 different gan models with different optimizers etc but we want to evolve them over 20 generations and we wouldn't record all the results and then note any interesting, interesting trends. Let's consider the generator noise. Like I said in previous slides, the data pre-processing step is important. So the noise is part of the data that goes into a GAN. So typically the GAN noise is sampled from a, a, a normal distribution or a uniform distribution. This is just you know common, common practice. But really in principle, you can sample from any prior distribution. So there's a recent paper that sort of inspired uh, this part of the experiment, uh, which introduced something called a truncation trick. And so the idea is that rather, and anyone who wants the paper, by the way, can simply just email us. So rather than sampling from the unit normal, we sample from a truncated normal. And the idea is that you get a trade-off between a diversity of the samples and the quality of the samples you generate. So if it's too diverse, you're getting something that looks like soup. Um, or, you know, just something that's gross. You, you, don't, you don't want soup, right? But if, if you focus too much on the quality, um, it, which means that your noise distribution looks more like a direct delta, you run the risk of mode collapse. You're probably going to learn something that, that generates something that's very similar to, you know, the same thing over and over again. And you don't want that. So there's a, there's a trade-off here that you have to sort of consider. So for this experiment, 
uh, rather than having also a noise vector, we decided to just use uh, noisy images. So there'll be channels by width, by height. And this is sort of just like an empirical, uh, you know, empirically inspired uh, approach to this experiment. So what we're going to do is uh, each pixel in these noisy channels are sampled from a truncated normal, and each chromosome is going to be sampling from a different normal. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more in the next slide, but the idea is that the uh, we hope that these images, um, we might be able to gain something, at, we may be able to gain some information over if we just use a noise vector. That's the idea of, of formatting, formatting the noise image rather than just simply a noise vector. And one more thing we want to talk about is that the uh, chromosomes have between five and uh, two and five noisy channels. So truncated and normal, what does that look like? So the blue, the blue is this, uh, you know, typical Gaussian, right? It's a new unit normal distribution. So this is what the noise values are sampled from typically for a GAN. But the red is a truncated normal. And this is what our GAN, uh, this is the noise that our GANs are going to be sampling from. And the idea is that, you know, of course, as these, uh, the GAN is, uh, well, sorry, the noise is going to be sampled from a smaller range of values and sometimes a larger range of values than, this, than what you see here in the red. But the idea is you do truncate the normal distribution so that the noise values are uh, restricted within a smaller interval. So let's talk about the architecture. So the architecture is going to include uh, convolutional layers, uh, bash room layers, and then prelude layers, and then also fully connected layers. And this applies to the discriminator. And then the generator is going to be the same thing, but use a, a transpose convolution layers, uh, which is upsampling rather than downsampling. Uh, bash norm and then prelude blocks. And then the channels are going to be you know even numbers between 2 and 128. The kernel size is going to be fixed to three by three. The reason why we do this is because if we have a variable number of layers, where let's say some network has 10 layers, other ones have seven, et cetera, et cetera, then the kernel size is going to be a very finicky thing to deal with because if your image gets too small, then the kernel won't be able to, won't, can't be applied to it. And that's just going to, that's going to literally make the algorithm crash and we don't want that to happen. So rather we keep it simple and just keep the kernel size fixed for now. It may, and this may matter going forward, but for now we keep it simple. For the bash room layer, this is going to be learnable bash room. This is not just, uh, it's not going to be just kind of a fixed bash room. It's going to be a, a learn, bash room with learnable, learnable parameters. So the momentum is going to be between uh, 0.05 and 0.95. And again, these are quantities that you could look up in um, learnable bash norm if you're confused with what they mean. But anyway, so then the prelude is going to be, the, of course, the parametric prelude activation function. And typically, prelude is, there's a, a unique parameter for prelude for each layer. But in our case, we chose a, a, a different parameter for each channel. So if you have a layer with 25 channels, then you're gonna have 25 different parameters of, of a prelude going into the next layer. And the idea of this is this is gonna control the importance of each channel. So this sort of goes to model explainability a little bit where you um, can understand exactly what channels are being activated the most as you go with the training. So that's, the, that's sort of the inspiration behind that. And then the fully connected layers are what you think they are, um, you know, just simply basic neurons, um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, from vanilla neural networks. And the hidden size is going to be between multiples of 10, between 10 and 2000, and you have between one and three hidden layers. So this slide is going to be the optimizer chosen. And then for anyone who wants to talk more about or ask us about the optimizers, uh, we can certainly be more happy to talk about that. But it'll take a little bit while to explain why we chose these ranges for optimizers. But the, the, really the overarching idea is that you don't, you don't want your learn rate to be too high because that leads to training instability, um, but you also don't want it to be too slow where it takes forever to train. The momentum sort of um, is where you keep the stability by making the learning rate small, but you accelerate the training time by having a, the, the momentum. That's the uh, philosophy behind this learning, the learning rates and momentum combinations. Um, and again, the, the numbers can be explained in more detail for anyone who's interested, but anyone who wants to pause can also take a look at it. But that's where the, the idea is behind it. And we use five optimizers. Um, so what that means is that each GAN model chooses between one of these five optimizers with, of course, a, a variable number of, or, and also randomly samples from these, these quantities over here. You know, so stochastic gradient descent, atom, RMS prop, eta grad, eta delta, you know, common five, opt common five opt. Now, the most important part of genetic algorithm, of course, is the fitness function. So this fitness function is gonna be normalized between zero and one, um, as you can see, you know, through the lambda and the gamma and the hyperbolic tangent usage that this is going to be between zero and one. So the idea is that the term on the left, the uh, the first term, which incorporates the generator and discriminator loss, this is going to be very important. So of course, as the loss shrinks, the fitness goes up. So that's really the, and of course, the point on one is just sort of a, a scaling parameter so that it just sort of, um you know, we want the loss to be roughly, you know, one one hundredth or less. And that's what we want, because it's not realistic to get less than that uh, too often. So that's sort of the, the reasoning behind that. As for the uh, gamma term, the gamma tangent HP, that is going to control the size, the number of parameters in the models. 
So the way that this P score is really just a million divided by the sum of weights in the generator and the discriminator. And this is going to be the number of weights, not the actual quantities of the weights. And again, this is this is chosen such that uh, you know that these terms balance to an extent. This is definitely a more of a this is a very much an engineered fitness function. Uh, it's just simply it's a good starting point. We probably will tweak it in future experiments, but it gets the job done. Let's talk about the challenges and benefits, right? So bad initialization of a genetic algorithm is not going to magically magically produce these good models. So there's a reason why neuroevolution, which is again genetic algorithms applied to deep learning. Uh, is not used all the time. It's because it's, it, take, it takes forever. And if you get bad initialization, you're going to get, get bad results regardless. So, and even if you do have good architectures somewhere living in that search space, it may take forever to find them. Because you have to go over a quadruple loop. Because you have to loop over your batches, your epics, your chromosomes, and your generation. So it's a quadruple loop. So it takes a long time to train. You know, days to weeks, depending. Could even be months if it's like really, really long training time. Now, the nice thing is that even if you have bad initialization, this tells you which chromosomes are fit. So what that means is you can, autom even if you record all the results, you can learn what models produce the results you wanted. And then maybe you can focus on shrinking the hyperparameters you want to consider. Because maybe only, let's say, four or five out of the six, or even like two out of the six, hyperparameters that I listed really matter in terms of GAN training. And then the rest of them aren't as important. So this gives you insight into what's most important to tune. So there's certainly knowledge that's gained, even from poor initialization. And then the nice thing is, since we use an elitist selection approach, that means each generation, the best models are going to be kept. And then the better models are, are kept over time. And there's a, there's a little bit of nuance that, that's, that goes here for those of people who are uh, who noticed a little flaw in this argument. But certainly if you rerun the same model, it's not going to get it's, it's not going to learn the weights the same way it did the first time. But in principle, if it learns, uh, if, if, if it does well a second time around, then we can be confident this is a good model. And, it and in principle, if it's it shouldn't produce wildly different results from the first time around. That's the guiding hypothesis between the leader selection. So that's why we keep the models in each generation and retrain them. That's that's the nuance that I want to briefly address. Anyway, so like I said, we record all we record all these results and then what this means is that we don't really need to build these GANs ever again because we simply just have the genetic algorithm evolve them for us. So we, we can say 10 GAN models each generation, we evolve them and sooner or later at the end of the evolutionary process, we'll end up with a couple of GANs that work well. And we didn't have to actually build them, it, we simply just defined what building blocks we want and we have the genetic algorithm assemble the building blocks for us in the best way. Now finally, let's talk about part 3. How can this be applied to medicine? Since we have already high-performing GANs for MNIST and CIFAR, why would we even consider using evolutionary algorithm? Wouldn't that be overkill? And yes, it is. That's not our end goal. Our goal was we want to be able to apply these to really any deep learning task, uh, supervised or unsupervised, and, you know, it's... But right now, we're focusing mostly on the GANs. But this can be applied to really any kind of um, deep learning problem. So, engineers don't have to build the models from scratch and spend time fine-tuning, because the genetic algorithm is sort of doing that for you when it's randomly initializing new models. So like I said, this is really AI creating AI. And if you have some modifications, and what that means is that if you learn to properly initialize it, you could get state-of-the-art results, and not just computer vision, but really any deep learning task. Now we're going to talk about exactly how GANs are going to be used for protein structure prediction. Let's suppose we have some kind of primary structure, which is, you know, of course, amino acids, and then we can, and then of course, a secondary structure, which is going to be the uh, alpha helices and the beta strands. And so there's already a paper which has explored this idea. And there's actually a decent amount of literature which applies uh, GANs to generating protein structures. Why is this so useful? Because that means that you can study any protein you want to by simply just, you know, you could just maybe take, you can feed in a primary structure and you could with a sophisticated enough, you know, GAN model, learn to output more uh, higher order geometric structures for the proteins, like, you know, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. And if we go back to our neuroevolution idea, this is probably hard to build in practice. So the neuroevolution will take the difficulty in building and fine tuning out for you. you. Simply just give it, you give it time and it will run and then you'll get the results you want to. One particular model I want to touch on, because this presentation is actually almost over, if you can believe it, uh, is going to be the super resolution GANs. And what do these do? These take a low resolution image and they upsample it to produce a high resolution image. So what that means for proteins, let's say you have some kind of protein, but you want to study in a detail that you did not actually see, let's say, in a lab or your previous computer simulation. So the GAN will upsample it for you and you'll essentially end up having a protein which is modeled at a scale that you did not specifically do yourself. So, and imagine now if you apply neuroevolution to this, your super resolution GAN can produce some very high fidelity protein structures. So it'll be more useful for analysis. So super resolution GANs are also a candidate for neuroevolution uh, for protein structure prediction for that reason.
let's really tie it all together. If we really condense everything into one picture, this is what we're trying to do with neuroevolution. So let's say we take some kind of protein structure, or if we want to go even more low, even more low level, a chemical structure. So we take, let's say, a chemical structure, we feed it into some, some deep generative model, and then we output a very, very high resolution, uh, higher order structure of proteins. Uh, and then we get some very nice geometry out of that. And this will allow us to, we study the proteins. This could also be used to study viruses. It could be used to study really any kind of organism, really for that, for, for, for that matter, uh, if you really, you know, take this idea and run with it. But this is really all we're trying to do. So in this middle part of it, we simply can take a genetic algorithm that evolves a degenerative model that we define. And then over time, you know, it has like, let's say 10 solutions or every generation you evolve for, let's say 20 generations or however many. And then you output, at the end of the day, you get a model such that you get a very, very good black box for this. And then and you output a, pro, a, a pro, good, pro, good protein structure. So how can this be applied to COVID-19? Well, certainly, let's say we take a, a virus and we want to generate realistic looking viruses, then you can potentially study mutations. So viruses, of course, mutate just by this naturally is how, how they work, right? And so viruses, will, and as they mutate, uh, you want to be able to understand in what ways can they mutate. And having a generative model just, just output the possible mutations for you and giving you a way to study them in a new way could be very, very useful. So this could potentially be very useful for the future of all kinds of, you know, uh, pro protein structure modeling, which, you know, anyone can tell you in, in epidemiology, this is very practical for medicine development. So, and every, of course, anyone in this field could give you even more applications than I could of how this can be used. But that's really what it all boils down to. What really it all boils down to, if you really want to have a good way to study proteins, one way to do this is simply through deep generative modeling. And you can evolve the deep generative models in a way that the human engineer does not have to do this. So that's pretty much really what this is all about. And let's say you are involved in medicine and you want to, you know, try your hand at this, but you don't really know how to code this or do anything like that. Well, luckily, Neuralist allows you to actually build these models uh, yourself. In our alpha version, we don't have GANs or other generative models yet, but in our beta release, and certainly for our full release, we'll be able to have GANs so users can feed in uh, you know, any kind of uh, biological data or chemical data, and they can learn to predict structures out of it. Um, there will be some helpful APIs that we're going to introduce, and then so there won't be any programming that the uh, epidemiologists or anyone related, in, anyone in medicine who wants to study this topic uh, needs to do. It'll all be done behind the scenes. So that's our goal for Neuralist, that we'll be able to fight, help fight COVID-19 other diseases in the future by simply taking out the difficult aspects of coding and introducing some very uh, sophisticated deep learning um, solutions to be able to actually implement uh, ways to help fight COVID-19. So I hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you guys in the next presentation.